Thanks for listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your hosts, Big Anklevich and Rish Outfield. Wow. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. My name is Big Anklevich. And I'm Rish Outfield. Any idea what number of episode this is? This would be episode 155. Okay. Humming right along. Okay, so this is another one of our live episodes or uh, live recordings. What, what would you call this? Yeah, I would say yeah, live recording. It's an recording. as live. It, <laughs> that's right. It's a look live. Look it was live. performed live in front of a studio audience. So we call it a live reading. And yeah, today's story is overtaken by one Rish Outfield. That brings us to the end of the show. So long, folks. That Rish Outfield guy, he's really prodigious with uh, his stories on the Dune Steve, isn't he? He's doing a good job. I need to kick his butt at some point and show him how many more stories I can put on. Yes, yes, you do. I'm starting to feel like Matt Wallace here, and I <laughs> I really... Uh, how dare you? Uh, well, but it's, it's, it's hard not to because we've got the little sketches that I write, and unless those go uncredited, there's my name again. I wrote a sketch. Yes, yes, you did. Unfortunately, I had to edit it out. We ran. Out of time. <laughs> I'm sorry, we're out of time. This is a, a really good story, I think. I'm setting people up to not enjoy it, I guess. Uh, <laughs> no, I think by saying the author's name, you set them up. To oh, oh it. okay. But yeah, I, I, I remember when you first passed this story along, and I really enjoyed it the first time around. I thought it was a really good one. And I encouraged you to. Prepare to die. <laughs> Put it out there somewhere to someone who would like to publish it. And you found this wonderful place called the Dune Steve that was willing to publish it. So nice of those guys. Um, actually, I I did sell it to a uh, competitor. Did but, you? But they never ran it. Oh, yeah? So uh, I, I suppose that this is its premiere. All right. I don't. I don't know what happened because they said, you know, here's your contract. You accept. And I accepted. And maybe it's come and gone. I don't know. And yeah, so here uh, it's going to be sh- heard for the first time. Well, the second time, because the people who were actually in the room heard it the first time <laughs> on the show on the Dune Steve. Let's see. Should we introduce the cast before or after? Uh, well, we can let people know that Dave Thompson, podcast enforcer, is our narrator. No way. And I think that's the first time we've had him narrate a story for us. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, we were given a list of folks that were going to be there, and I thought, whoa, Dave Thompson. He is the only intelligent one here. Yeah. <laughs> I want to have him do something. And so, yeah, we decided to have him as our narrator. I think he was surprised, maybe because he's never been on our show before, that we would entrust him to be the narrator of your story. I'm not sure... Maybe well, he was we, just like, yeah. Oh, I don't know, but um, I think he was surprised. <laughs> that sounds more like me. Oh, and it's like, hey, we'd like you to be the lead in our story. We don't know you, and I'm like, well, yeah, of course you do. <laughs> How <laughs> dare you? The the thing with with Dave is that you know you and I have been listening to podcasts all since it began. Mm-hmm. Uh, it since began before like, it was a Dave Thompson joint. And it began uh, like two months before our show began. You know that. Did it really? Yeah, something right around there was really close. Oh, see, I, I seem to remember us. Well, maybe we had recorded our first couple episodes before Podcastle began, but it doesn't matter. We're, we're, we're all winners in the game of life. You're a winner anyways. A winner? The uh, point I was trying to make. Oh, but, but we'd listened to so many of his episodes, and he, he is a really good, he has a, a very listenable style of the way he talks. Plus, he's super professional. You know, he's done it so many times that you can entrust him with a long story like this. Wait, was this one long? It wasn't long for a Rich Outfield story. It was uh, rather short, actually, when you consider the author. Okay. But it was average size. Um, That's what she said. Go ahead. (laughs) As far as stories go. Uh, We should just run the darn thing and then we can talk afterward if you want to. But yeah, uh, Dave Thompson is in this, and then there's Abby uh, Hilton, Renee, 
Shambliss and then the two of us are, are all doing voices in this one. And I think we all get introduced anyways. Renee does the introduction this time, so we'll just have her take it away. Take it away, Renee. Hello, everyone. I'm really glad to see you all. This is a little different than the other kinds of sessions, but we have so much fun doing it, and we're really excited to share it with you. And this is overtaken by Rish Outfield. We have the author. He is right here. And a lot of podcast fiction is written by the podcaster, him or herself. So that's why we wanted to do a story like this, and it's a lot of fun. So, um... Enjoy. We've, oh, I guess I should introduce us, Todd. Huh? We have Dave Thompson. He's down here. Dave is from the audio fiction magazine podcastle.org. He's going to be narrating the story. Rich Outfield and Big Anklevich are from the Doonstief.com, which is another audio fiction magazine. We have Abigail Hilton. She's back there. She has podcast her own writing, and you can find all of her great writing at abigailhilton.net. And I am Renee Chambliss. I am a writer turned podcaster, turned audio fiction narrator. And so let's, let's get going, okay? All right. Thank you all. Overtaken. It was October 13th, the middle of the month, the newly formed National Face Your Fears Day. And in Tracy, Arizona, it was takeover day. Barry and Nicole Duggar had just moved into town, still had a dozen boxes left to unpack from their move, and had not been told about October 13th. Usually a new arrival would be informed when they went to church, or registered their kids for school, or attended a neighborhood barbecue, but the Duggars were always traveling back to Colorado, trying to sell their old house, and weren't very social to begin with. The doorbell rang at 6.30 in the morning, and neither got up to answer it. They had no house telephone as they both carried cell phones. They had no children, and if they chose to ignore something, it was ignored. The envelope placed in their mailbox the day before was still there, as Nicole hadn't thought to check the mail. Barry had been the editor of a now-defunct magazine in Denver, and still did freelance editing over the internet, while Nicole sewed dog costumes and sold them online, so they had no reason to rise before nine. At quarter after, the doorbell rang again, and this time, Nicole went into the living room to answer it. At the door was Jason Perkins, the man with the huge house and army of children down the street. He nervously licked his lips and then put on a reassuring smile. Hello, uh, is, your, uh, is your husband at home? Barry's shaving, she said. Can you come back? I'll wait, he said, giving her a little nod. It's uh, actually quite important. All right. Mr. Perkins noticed an envelope taped to their door. Someone left this for you, he said, pulling it off and handing it to Nicole. Has anyone talked to you already about today? About today? What's today? It's... we call it takeover day. Like corporate takeover? No, no, not like that. He forced a smile. I'll explain as soon as your husband is out. You she frowned. Want- So that's how things worked around here. You don't want to explain to me? Oh, oh, yes, of course I do. Perkins protested. I'd just rather not have to tell it twice. You know? She didn't, but she invited Jason Perkins in and had him sit on the sofa and went back to check on Barry. Bear? She knocked on the bathroom door, then opened it and peeked inside. Her husband had not yet shaved and was just rinsing the toothpaste from his mouth by leaning over the sink and sucking water from the faucet, a habit she despised. Bear, we've got a visitor. Uh, Who is it? Mr. Perkins. He wants to talk to you, or us. Uh, I'll be right out. She went back down the hall, wondering if she should offer Perkins a glass of water while they waited. The man was standing by the piano, looking at the photo frames lining it. He pointed to the one of Barry and Ray Bradbury. Is this your father-in-law? No. That's a writer Barry got to work with. He nodded and looked at the frame again. And where are you? I took the picture. There was silence between them, but then Barry came in, drying his hands on his jeans. Good morning. Morning. Jason, isn't it? Yes, Jason, or Jay in my younger years. All right. Uh, What's up? Perkins stood up straighter. As I told your good wife here, 
Today is takeover day here in Tracy. Has anyone talked to you about this? Taking over what? I guess that's a no. Would you mind sitting down? They didn't mind. Perkins sat in the chair opposite them, like a teacher or interviewer. Have either of you experienced anything strange today? Uh, somebody came to the door around five this morning. Barry said. But I don't know who it was. No, 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 not like that. You see, this town was built on what some call an intersection of ley lines. A kind of crossroads. And every 13th of October, things happen to people. Things. Nicole said. People get taken over. Controlled. Perkins swallowed. By outsiders. Barry became suspicious. Outsiders like us? No. Real outsiders. People... People are fine one minute, and then... Nicole went rigid. Are you talking about possession, like demonic possession? Perkins smiled politically. We don't like to use that word. That's for Hollywood. And we don't know that they're demons, just others. Both Nicole and Barry looked from their guest to each other. Nicole rolled her eyes. Is this some kind of a joke? Barry asked Perkins. No, it's not a joke. It's just a unique part of living in Tracy. Perkins stood up and began to instruct. Nicole thought he must have worked as a teacher or a pastor. We Tracy residents close up our businesses on takeover day. People go home and wait it out. It's safer that way. He put on a reassuring smile again. I suggest you two have a big breakfast and... Wait. Nicole interrupted. People get possessed every year in this town. Is that what you're saying? Taken over, yes. And it's not everybody. Usually around half of the people. Sometimes it happens for a minute, sometimes for an hour or more. Depending on the year. <clears throat> she wanted to laugh, but wouldn't allow herself. This is seriously not a joke? A prank on the new folks on the block? Not at all. Usually we let people know by... At least by the first of the month. But you two seem to have slipped by. Barry shook his head. Why would anyone choose to live in a town like that? Perhaps it chooses us. Why did you decide to move here? House was cheap, Barry said. Very cheap. Nicole added. Both of them now suspected it was due to the crazy people in the neighborhood. To answer your question, all of us who choose to live here are rewarded by the outsiders. In return for the brief inconveniences of this day, we are healthy, we are fruitful, we are successful, we are happy. Barry didn't come from a religious household, but Nicole did. You're saying the outsiders bless you? Perkins smiled, nodding like a proud teacher. That's it, exactly. You'll see. Nicole sighed, but Barry was still not convinced. This is all a bit hard to believe, uh, but if it were true, why wouldn't you people just leave town every October 12th? 13th. Nicole corrected. That is an option. But it's kind of like someone who lives in the mountains choosing to leave when the weather gets colder and the leaves change and the snow falls. It might be more convenient, but you miss the wonders of winter and fall. That's hardly the same thing. Nicole remembered the envelope she'd found taped to their door. She opened it and read the note inside. Sure enough, October 13th was also takeover day to Mrs. Hoverson down the block. No, maybe not, Perkins said. But some people like weather changes. Others choose to live in Arizona or California. We have benefits for putting up with it all. If you choose to stay, you'll see what we mean. So does everybody get blessed? Nicole asked. Or just the ones who get possessed? Uh, taken over, Perkins clarified. Everyone is rewarded, but those who are the most inconvenienced are the most rewarded. Barry cleared his throat. <clears> throat> he was about to start yelling. Nicole stopped him. What happens? What is it like? The takeover. Perkins sat down again. You become a spectator of your own body. You watch what happens, but are powerless to interfere. Uh, at least that's how it is for me. It can be quite upsetting the first time. Or most times, really. But what do you do? Jump around? Speak in tongues? Throw up pea soup? It depends. On, On what? what? They both said together. 
on the passenger. Some are benign. Some are a bit more <clears throat> alien. He put up his hand, stopping their train of thought. For lack of a better word. Nicole squinted. So, are they aliens or are they demons? We don't know. Barry turned to his wife. You're buying this? I think I am. She said. It's too crazy to be a joke. Uh, where's the logic in that? He asked. But Mr. Perkins put up his hand again. I don't know how to convince you. Some people have to see to believe. But I do ask that you stay at home today, where you're safe. People in cars have had accidents when the takeover happens. Nicole nodded. We weren't really planning on going anywhere today anyway. Barry grumbled but said nothing. Mr. Perkins stood up. Well, I must go. I'm feeling a little dizzy, and that's usually the first stage. Wait, you're going to get pos uh, taken over right now? In a few minutes, I think. Of course, I had no breakfast today. I could just be hungry. He smiled, but it was an anxious one. Thank you for seeing me. He started for the door, then stopped and turned back. His fingers were twitching slightly. Oh, I I'd stay out of the kitchen. Or at least lock up the knives. Just in case. Barry and Nicole also stood up. In case of what? He asked a little louder than he intended. He was nervous now, definitely. I have to go. Perkins said again and practically ran out the front door. Nicole closed it behind him. So, what's the verdict? Barry asked. I don't know. He seemed to believe it, but I don't know if that makes him crazy or just the kind of person who... Barry <sighs> sighed. I'm, I'm glad you think so, too. Uh, the guy may be harmless, but he's clearly delusional. But on only one day of the year? Who knows? Uh, next week he may say it's the 20th of October. Do you think he wrote the note? It says Abigail Hoverson, and it looks like a woman's handwriting, but... Suddenly, they heard something crash out front. They went to their window and saw Mr. Perkins banging his head against their mailbox. He was naked. Uh, Barry? Yes, dear? Our neighbor is a nudist. And Jewish, apparently. They chuckled nervously, <laughs> but Nicole deadbolted yeah. the front door and Barry lowered the Venetian blinds. Outside, the man was keening in an unnatural, high-pitched voice. Barry, I'm scared. The sound was almost animal-like, upsetting. Yeah, I, I guess we should call the police. Right, unless... Uh, unless what? Unless you think we should call his wife, tell her what's going on. He led her away from the door, back to the couch. What's their number? I don't know. You could ask the operator... Call directory assist... No, this is probably something for the police. Despite what the Democrats say, a naked dude running loose is seldom a good thing. We could call Miss Stone across the street. I have her number. Why her? You know, to ask her about takeover day. Barry sighed. So, he's really possessed, for sure? Wasn't he crazy a minute ago? I don't know. Maybe she could tell us if this is something he does all the time. There was another bang outside, and a car alarm began to sound. It wasn't their car, though. It was farther down the block. Barry pulled his cell phone from his pocket and opened it. I'm calling the cops. Sorry, honey. He dialed and got a dispatcher asking what kind of help he needed. Uh, I'm sorry, are you in uh, Colorado or Arizona? He asked. Because uh, we got the phone in Denver and... Arizona, sir. The dispatcher said, sounding bored. Can you tell me the nature of your emergency? Well, uh, it isn't uh, really an emergency, but if you could put us in contact with the Tracy Police Department, if there is such a thing, or, or maybe the county sheriff or something. Uh, we're new in town. Uh, we don't really know. Barry. Nicole sat at his side. What's the problem, sir? The dispatcher asked again. I'll transfer you to the appropriate department. Uh, well, it's our neighbor. He seems to have had some kind of breakdown or, or something. We're not sure. Barry. Oh, sir, you're in Tracy? The dispatcher asked, realizing something. I saw something earlier. I need to transfer you. Is that all right? Barry? Sure, all right. I'm feeling dizzy. Okay. He said, trying to listen to both conversations with an ear. Honey. Now she was getting scared. Uh, I'm on hold now. He told her. Uh, what's up? 
She didn't answer. He looked over and saw a curious look on her face, an expression, or lack of one. Her face was blank. Nicole? She stood still, not moving a muscle, just staring at nothing, and Barry forgot about the phone call. Nicole? She blinked then, her eyes focusing on the room around her, on the walls, on her husband. You okay? Barry asked. She looked at him as he spoke, still no expression on her face. She was on her feet, but she looked like she was sleeping. Barry took a concerned step toward her. His stepbrother was a diabetic, and he sometimes looked like this if his blood sugar dropped. He touched her arm. Nicole? At his touch, she gasped slightly, barely a sound, but it made a difference in her demeanor. She smiled. She looked down at his hand, then at the swell of her breasts under her t-shirt. She looked up again, and the smile had become a grin. Barry inched backward. Nicole's grin became a leer. This was not the face of his wife. Honey? He said, it coming out barely a whisper. She smiled at him, still standing completely still, nearly all of her teeth visible. He'd never noticed how sharp her canines were. She looked reptilian. S snap out of it, Nicole. He said louder. Nicole. She said back to him. It was her voice exactly, but the inflection was all wrong, like a recording played backward. What's happening? He asked, his tone already back to a whisper. Seven. She repeated. The person he was talking to spoke no English. Barry swallowed. What have you done with Nicole? We oui, Nicole. The intruder said. What do you want? Nicole opened her mouth, but instead of repeating, she said something else. Something that sounded like... It wasn't any language he'd ever heard before. The unnatural smile returned to her face, and she began to walk toward him. Her legs moved stiffly, almost painfully, as though both her feet had gone to sleep. Barry backed away, or rather, he tried to back away. But the side of the couch was suddenly up against him, and his wife narrowed the gap before he could slip away. He put one of his hands up to keep her back, and she walked right into it, her right boob cupping itself into his palm. She made a small noise then, a happy sound that actually did sound like Nicole. For a moment, he wondered if this wasn't just an elaborate prank his wife was playing, but he looked at her face, and there was no recognition there. Her eyes were those of a stranger. She leaned in, and he was afraid. Afraid she might hurt him. Afraid she might eat him. She had leaned in all the way and kissed him, her mouth practically devouring his. She pressed herself against him, with more strength than she usually demonstrated, and began to lick him on the mouth, the chin, the face. It was not at all pleasurable, though Barry would have never imagined that to be the case and he could feel her saliva running down his cheek and chin. A moment later, she started licking his eyes, and Barry couldn't take it anymore. Hey, honey, please! She pulled away from him, still grinning, and said another foreign word. This one sounded like... Zivas! She put one hand to Barry's throat, and the other grabbed his crotch with such force that he cried out. Ah. The Nicole thing began to laugh. It sounded like nothing like his wife's laugh, or anything he'd ever heard before. This person wasn't a human being. No! He cried, pushing away from her. As he tried to slip away, she lashed at his neck with her fingernails. The scratch burned like a white hot flame, but still slipped out of her embrace and into the center of the living room. Close, go! She shouted. He didn't know what it meant, but it might have been, how dare you? Or, get back here. He kept moving, heading down the hall. He could hear her behind him, wheezing as she forced the unfamiliar body to walk down the hall. He ran into the bathroom and slammed the door, locking it in one fluid movement. He leaned against it, only then realizing he was hyperventilating, his gasps surprising and unnerving him. Outside the bathroom, Nicole began to scratch the door, not in a dangerous attempt to claw her way in, but in a playful, seductive way. He heard her laugh again, 
<laughs> the strangers laugh from before. <laughs> then she went silent. A minute passed. Had she gone away? He didn't know how long he stood there, but after a while she made one more sound, revealing she had been standing there all along. It was another word in her alien tongue. Stolfos. Then there was a sharp intake of air, and his wife was back. Barry! Barry, open up! He started to unlock the door, then reconsidered, scanning the room for something to defend himself. He grabbed the toilet plunger from the corner of the bathroom, wielding it like a baseball bat. He opened the door, raising his weapon, and almost swung it when Nicole moved toward him. But she was smiling, and it was her normal smile. The smile of his wife. Oh, Barry, can you believe it? He put his arm around her, still grasping the plunger with the other. Her skin was flushed, much warmer than normal. How, how much do you uh, remember? He stuttered. She drew away slightly. Everything. Bear, it was like... Like I was watching a video taken when I was drunk. I was there, but I had no control over myself. Barry swallowed. How horrible. And then she began to laugh. <laughs> Nicole? Barry, oh my god, it was the weirdest thing. You were... I was afraid, he said, <laughs> nervous at the chuckle still escaping the sides of her mouth. Yes, yes, you were. Sorry, but Barry, you have no idea what it was like. She was still smiling, her bosom heaving with her deep breath. The hardness of her nipples was very prominent through the fabric of her shirt. Nicole, what's with you? I don't know. She giggled. But I feel so good. Better than I have in a long time. I could just run a marathon. I could sew 20 super dogs in an hour. I feel... I feel like I did in junior high kissing Clay Lincoln during that Wilson Phillips song at the dance. Barry looked at her with a mixture of relief and skepticism. He was still skittish, as if she would revert at any moment, an evil stranger's glare in her eyes. I'm sorry, she said, seeing his expression. I know you were, what, upset by it? It w wasn't you. No, something else. What? I don't know. I couldn't communicate with it. But wow, it really wanted to get a hold of you. Yeah. He should have been flattered, maybe. That a Martian found him attractive, but he mostly felt violated. The question was, why didn't she? Why did it leave? Its time was up. The last thing it said was something like that. Like a kid told by his mom he has to get off the slide and go home. Only then did her smile fade. Not in thinking of her body being possessed, or her husband being groped, but in the disappointment of some squatter being told to move on. Then, her smile came again. Shit, Barry, I feel awesome. Are you hungry? I'm kind of hungry. Do you want me to make you something? How about pasta? Do you feel like fucking? Barry shook his head. He didn't get it. But seeing her like this wasn't a bad thing. She had been such an energetic, life-embracing girl when they'd met, and part of that had gone away in the intervening years. Until now... You sure you're okay with this? He asked. Yeah. I mean, I'm sorry you were scared, but I knew almost immediately that things were going to be all right. And it was only for a minute, you know? It was more than a minute, he said. He realized he was still holding the toilet plunger. His knuckles were white around it. However long it was. It wasn't so bad. And now I... She figured something out. You know what it was like... When you're nauseated, and then you throw up, and as bad as throwing up is, as soon as you're done, you feel better. So much better. All right. He said. I hear you. Takeover day. She marveled. Every October. Barry said nothing. He watched her dance around, euphoric as a kid with a belly full of chocolate. He supposed she was all right now, and no real harm was done. He set the plunger on the floor. I'm gonna go start soaking the linguine, she proclaimed, and jogged toward the kitchen, her backside swishing. When Barry rose up, he felt lightheaded all of a sudden. The room was spinning. Nicole? He said tentatively. She didn't hear him. 
Nicole! Honey? She asked from the other room. What's up, Buttercup? He tried to answer her, but he couldn't make himself talk. Something else was in his head. Something. Something with many outstretched fingers. The fingers wrapped around his mind, taking over. He watched himself reach for the plunger again. Now, a word about what is best in life. I don't know. Uh, um... To crush your enemies, see them driven before you, and to hear the lamentation of their women. Zing! All right, so there's our story, Overtaken, by Rish Outfield. Now, what, you called it something else a minute ago. Do you prefer that title to Overtaken? Did I call it Takeover Day? You did. <laughs> I don't prefer the title, it's just... That's how you first knew it. Was it called that to begin with? Uh, the file name was Takeover Day. Yeah, it was the the premise was that, and then it's I uh, I don't know that the story was ever called Takeover Day, but it huh, could easily yeah. be. I think it was called Overtaken when I first read it, but because it they never say Overtaken, they just say Takeover Day in the story. It's just one of those kind of things that you. Mentally switch for some reason, I guess. I don't know. So is this a story that you have particular love for or anything like that? Hey, we've got the author here. Let's have an author's note. <laughs> that's funny because that's what Renee note. said at the beginning, too, is podcasters often run their own stories. <laughs> and we happen to have the author here. We had actually a big crowd to listen to this, and I... I that intimidated me a little bit because I expected, you know, people to start leaving. And luckily, <laughs> you know, only about 40% of them did. I don't know. The, the quality of actors that were on the panel really helped carry the story. Any of the weaknesses that it might have had sort of get eclipsed by the talent of the people performing them. At least that's what I think. What was the question? Oh, do I have a high regard for this story? Is See, this one that you like particularly amongst your cadre of stories? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I like this story quite a bit. It's hard for me to toot my own horn, though, because you'll go blind. Point at Rish and laugh. And so if you've ever listened to my Rish outcast, every single one of those stories I'll end with, well, it's it's not a great story, but... And I, I didn't realize that until I was editing like three of them. And I was like, wait, did, I've edited this one before. <laughs> and I went back and I was like, no, I say this. It's not a great story in all of those. <laughs> but I think that's just me. I, I'm always going to say, well, eh, it's not a great story. I think Rish is right. I, I don't know if the story is as good as the idea behind it, as the premise. I just I really love that idea of going to some little town where the rules aren't the normal rules. There's something strange about this little town. And I've written a couple of stories like that with, with a premise like that where you go into the town. And uh, the thing with this story was it it's weird, but I tried to not have it be too dark at the very beginning. I, I tried to make it so it's sort of amusing at the beginning to kind of undercut what's going to happen later. Because it is dark. It is just, it's meant to be upsetting or disturbing or, yeah, it's like, oh, yeah. if somebody said, you know, I'm not really sure I liked that story. I'd be like, oh, okay, that's, that's valid. Now, you're not supposed to like it, child. And so, yeah, with, with Dave Thompson, who was narrating it, I asked him if he wouldn't mind starting out the narration as though this is going to be a funny story and then making a shift somewhere. Once it's clear, it's not a funny story anymore. And again, I, I, I think you and Renee did all the heavy lifting on this one. I mean, Dave does fine, but Renee has got a strange... Uh, she, she, she plays more than one character in here, you know? Right. And, uh, and she had to say those words. 
I wonder how nervous she was. Did you did she ever let on about being nervous about saying those words? I know I know that you were kind of nervous about forcing her to say those words. I don't even remember what they were now. Well, she speaks in some kind of language to him. Yeah. Uh, and I couldn't remember at the time whether I had you know just sentence after sentence of nonsense. I think what it is is it sounded something like Kathathothi or whatever. Kathathothi. Yeah, that sort of thing. And that you can't really screw up. The thing that she did the best was when she was speaking English, but it was clear she didn't know what she was saying. That was neat. Yeah, when she was repeating what I had said. Yeah, I did that. Sappening. Yeah. That was good stuff. I don't know. I I, I feel self-conscious talking about my story in such a way. What is what are your thoughts on the the, the story? Do, do you agree that it starts out with a ridiculous premise, so you think, oh, this is going to be a funny story, or because of the author, do you know that it's not going to be a funny story? Or <laughs> what what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think the author has made himself a few funny stories to where you don't automatically think that. You know, we we've all heard House of Ideas just recently, and. While it's not a hilarious story, it's not a dark story in any way, except for the one guy who, what happened to the one guy? He got like killed with a pen knife or something. Yeah, uh, somebody stabbed a him. A ballpoint pen, a fountain pen. I don't remember what it was, but there was this slight bit of darkness in House of Ideas. But I don't think just because it's Rich Outfield that people will think, oh, this is going to be a scary story. This is going to be a... It's not like a big Enklevich story. We're like, oh, no, there's a baby in it. (laughs) Oh, no, there's a baby in it. (laughs) Because then you know (laughs) that the baby's going to die by the end. (laughs) (laughs) You need to write more stories. So we uh, the averages can be increased. So it can bring it back down to, to normal levels. But, yeah, I think... You know, there's there's wacky stuff. The guy comes over and, and then he goes out and he's naked and he's banging his head on the mailbox and shouting and odd language or whatever. You know, that kind of stuff is humorous. But it's still, I think, it, it, it always has that undercurrent, I think, of darkness to it. There's jokes and quips and things like that. But being possessed by others, you know, it's hard to put anything but a dark scary turn to that because yeah i mean it's just an awful thing the idea of being in your body but not being in control of your body because someone else is in control of it or you know even just like a reality kind of a thing like you're in your body but you're crazy so you can't control you know that kind of a thing that's a scary dark thing and uh it's difficult to play it as funny and yeah, it starts out light. There's this young couple and they sew dog costumes for a living. <laughs> Super dogs. How dare you. <laughs> Which uh, amused me because I know that it was somewhat based off of me and my my wife, I think. Am I right or am I crazy? I, I wasn't intentional, if so. Oh, she, okay. did, did she sew dog costumes? No, she, on the internet? she did sew things and sell them on the internet for a while. She sewed human costumes. She sewed dresses and sold them online for a while. So I just assumed that, that was probably what that came from. Any clue as to where the names came from? Oh, well, of course the names all came from folks that uh, were associated with the podcast. Yeah, there was Nicole was the main character, or one of them at least. Jay Perkins is <laughs> the neighbor. Who else did we have? What was the what was the husband's name? His name was Barry. Oh, yes, Barry Northern. Yeah, that was all fun. And Brian was actually in the audience for it, and that was surprising because his name gets mentioned there. And But yeah, I... I don't know. There's something about this story. It's always been one of my favorites of yours. And we're working our way through all the ones that are my favorites. Maybe my favorites of yours are the ones that you actually shared with me, as opposed to the rest that you've been sitting on and hiding from view. 
Well, yeah, they're, they're, I am trying to put my stories out there more. Uh, I had a goal when I first signed up with Smashwords that I would put up a story every week. And uh, for a little while there, I actually accomplished that. And then uh, the holidays happened and I stopped. But in the new year, I started doing it again. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if I have 15 or 20 stories up. Nice. Many of which are free. Like the sad tale of the... Minnesota, Minnesota Diarrhea, Diarrhea Ghost. Ghost. Yes, I, I, I wrote that to amuse you one day, and it didn't work. And from, judging from all the comments on it, it hasn't worked for anyone. <laughs> but yeah, that's that's kind of something that I... I mean, when we talked about how we want to get the podcast going back up to full steam and, and so forth, one of the things that you said that we would do was have an About Us page on the dune steve which would have you know our pictures and it would talk about us and say where you could find our blog and where you could find our tweets and facebook and all that kind of crap and that's got to be up by now right oh yeah and i also was thinking that it would be cool to have like a links to all the stories that we've had on episodes of the show and so i searched for my name and found that i have very few on the show and then I searched for your name, and in like the last ten episodes, like three or four of them were your stories. And I thought, man, I really need to step it up and catch up with that guy, because that's kind of the point. That's one of the things that I wanted to change about the show was that there would be more of our stuff on there, so it would be more incentive for us to write, so that we would work on that and get there and be able to showcase our stuff. And so, yeah, that's something definitely that I need to improve. It's funny because I, not too long ago, lost my keychain thumb drive. I had a, I always keep a thumb drive on my keychain that I can just plug right into the computer. And I'll put various files that I use a lot back and forth kind of a thing. Some stuff for the podcast or whatever that I can just use wherever I'm at. And also, you know, when I'm writing somewhere that is not my home i can just plug that in and save the the story onto it and it just fell off i I got a brand new one because of the ones that i've got are always made out of plastic and then the little piece that you hook the keychain onto always cracks and breaks off and then i gotta get a new one and so i finally this time i'm like okay i'm getting one that has a metal hook on it so it doesn't break off anymore apparently i chose wrong because this one broke off like a hundred times faster than the plastic ones did And yeah, within like two weeks of having bought the dang thing, it just disappeared. And I thought, oh crap, I don't know when the last time, I I haven't been, I should come home and back it up onto my home computer, but I haven't been. And I realized that I was probably missing some files and I fired up my computer to see just how many I was missing. And one of the things that you had me do a while ago was separate my stories out by the year that they were written in and I looked and I saw that I didn't even have a 2012 folder much less 2013 and I was like crap that's two years worth of stories that I lost that I don't even know what stories they are that I lost but I've lost all two years worth and then miracle of miracles somebody found my thumb drive it had come off of my keychain in the parking lot at work and somebody found it and they plugged it in and saw my name on one of the files. And so they said, oh, this is yours. And they gave it back to me. And I looked in there and it was all there. And I was like, yay. And I looked on the 2012 and 2013 folders. I haven't written squat in those two years. I, I, I could have been just fine having never found that again. Because there was nothing of worth on there. All the stories were like little short stories, 2,000 words or less simple stories maybe a rewrite of an old story i guess i could say the excuse of two years ago was when the baby was born and so between now and then it's been hard to find time to write for sure but seeing that makes me think doubly i need to get going on it i need to write more because if that's all i got to show for the last two years that's pretty lame And so, yeah, I wrote just the other day, I I was getting my oil changed and I I have a notebook in the back, in the trunk of my car that I have for occasions like this. And I have a story that I've been working on and 
every time I'm in a, a waiting room like that. So I wrote a, a couple of pages. I don't know how many words, probably a thousand words in the time I was sitting there waiting for my oil to get changed. So that was fun. And uh, hopefully I can finish that story up. I don't know if I'll put it out on the show, though, because it's kind of dirty. And it makes me feel weird. <laughs> well, I, I, this one was kind of dirty. Uh, Overtaken was. Yeah, there's that one word. And I didn't realize it was coming. You know, Renee's a real trooper. She'll read whatever you put in front of her. But uh, I felt a little bit uncomfortable being in the room with her and hearing her having to say that word. But, you know, no big deal. Because with the next one, you know, there was plenty of that word to go around <laughs> in the next story that we read. But uh, in your defense, we I, I can think of two episodes of the show that are stories you've written that are upcoming and then one more that your name is on that is the, all all of them coming soon okay well that's good and if somebody want if somebody wants to go to your blog and check out the ankle cast you actually did a reading of a story of your own on the ankle cast yeah that was one of my ago. one of my 2012 slash 2013 stories <laughs> well it's more than than <laughs> nothing then but no that's a good goal to have is you know to do more of your own stuff I mean, it's it's been neat to have a podcast and know that if Drabblecast won't take it, we will. <laughs> In many cases, I don't even bother to send it to Drabblecast because I know we will. And they won't. Oh, I mean. <clears throat> but, well, I mean, it's fun to read these stories anyway, but it's fun when people say that they like them. Yeah, that's one of the things that I hope is that I'll get to the point where people will see my name on a story and say, oh, cool. I hope that that happens when a, an episode comes down the line and they think it's a good thing, that it's a, a B. D. Anklevich story. And I also hope that I put enough of them out there that people will get a feel maybe for what I write. It, it can be like you were saying earlier where you said, oh, yeah, well, you knew the story was going to end badly because of the author's name. What will people know because of an auth you know, if my name is on a story, do they know anything yet? I know some listeners have said that they don't have enough of my stories to be able to say what to expect, but I want to make it so that they can. I mean, there's some stories out there that are mine that uh, are in other places like the ankle cast or on incentive episodes or whatever. Bosley Gravel's Cavalcade of Horror. Yeah, there you go. But yeah, that's uh, that's my goal for the uh, upcoming year, years, is that uh, you'll be able to hear a lot more of my work and a lot less Rish Outfield. Oh, I mean... <laughs> I think Big is right. A, a similar amount of my work to that of Rish Outfield. We'll say that. Yeah, that was the goal when, when we decided to close submissions. And uh, so far, it hasn't really worked out that way but we'll see six months from now we'll see if uh, you do a search and your name comes up a lot more so we'll go ahead and call this a uh, episode it's not supposed to go on very long and i fear that we did but yeah. not too long much less than we normally do <laughs> well, they, they get their money's worth that's right when uh, it's a long episode yeah Remember but only somebody? only if they donate do they get their money's worth all right. Uh, tell people how they might donate. Well, it's funny you should ask. There's a button. There's actually three buttons that you can choose from on our website. They're, they have the, our, our fancy spiral D is the first letter in the word donate. And you can click on that <laughs> and uh, you can pick one of them. There's the one time donation or the two subscriptions where you can donate every month or every quarter. Head on over to the site. It's doonsteve.com, and you can donate to the show. And uh, we use those donations to make the podcast go. And to uh, go to the New Media Expo every year. Yeah, there you go. That money really came in handy when it came time to eat. <laughs> but uh, I, one other thing I wanted to mention is that Gino Moretto did the episode art for this episode. And, I mean, he's done a lot of episode art for us. Um, but uh, I did want to acknowledge him because he's uh, been very generous and uh, he uh, he's always anxious to do more for us. And 
and a lot of people have done episode art for us and and it's it's been really nice when it's not me doing the episode art when it's not me just going and finding a picture that more or less fits and cropping it and throwing title on and spitting it out yeah but sometimes those look really good so it's the ones where you know it's drawn by me and it's still in pencil that i go i don't know guys anyway uh, i just wanted to say that and now a word from our sponsor prepare to hold the hand of fear's accomplice and be guided through a world of terror Along the way, you will encounter all manner of frights, from unmentionable supernatural beings to pure human evil, and all the absurdity that falls into the dark spaces between. Will you crumble after the first tale, or can you stomach it to the death? Fear's Accomplice, Volume 1, an anthology of 19 horror short stories edited by T. M. McLean. Available on Amazon, Smashwords, and CreateSpace now. Buy your copy today. I didn't expect the Spanish Inquisition. I love that Josh Groban, personally. All right. Um, So we will be back soon with the final live reading. I hope you enjoyed this one, and we'll be back again next time. Thanks for listening, everybody. I'm Big Anglovich. And I'm Rich Outfield. Why not? Yeah, really. Why not? Oh. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. This means that you may share these files with anyone, but you may not charge for them or alter them. That's it. I'm out of here. Take two. When does this kick in? Before the title is read. I really will. Takeover Day. Do you really want it to be that, that ominous? Because I. I think the first couple pages it's supposed to seem like, or at least that's how I told Dave to read it, is to set the audience's expectations that this is going to be a funny story and then change once it stops being funny. Okay. I can change but it. But that's what I... I can put circus music on. No, don't do that. <laughs> but it's just... And okay. yeah, your take is, is totally valid. I just... I liked the idea of... And maybe not like circus music, happy music, but just, you know, this is strange, but we don't know if it's good strange or bad strange. And then that kicks in once we realize this is this bad This is strange. bad strange. All right. I will uh, but, uh, get some more music for that. Otherwise. Gosh, the guy's got stuff is good though. I, I uh, I've been putting it over uh, outcast uh, stories and stuff, and I listen to something and think that would work, and then I'll listen to the next one and go, that would work. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like any of them would work. And I've written a couple of stories like that with with a premise like that, where you go into the town and, and something the vice come. It, yeah, that's that sort of thing. It, the bice possess you, or the bice lives there, or something about the bice. I don't think there were any bice in this story, sir. Oh, there was. It just didn't speak our language. <laughs> so we don't know what it was called. Uh, Everything is the bice, is it not? I mean, it's, it's just a catch-all name for whatever the monster or thing might be, right? You, no? You're a, a bad person. <laughs> The nothing, <laughs> then it shows that you what the f is that? That's the part that goes under our garage, the foundation of the house, and that's uh, the kitchen before it was built. Thing there's actually a few stories. If uh, in my defense, there's a few stories in our back catalog that are my stories but aren't under my name. <laughs> no, we, we, I can't accept that defense. We're gonna have to cut that out. Ah. Oh. How did we decide that Overtaken would be the story that we'd do for on the panel? We were going to choose one that we wrote. We were looking for one that would be the right length. And uh, yeah, you just looked at the ones that you had at that length, and I looked at the ones that I had at that length, which was like none. And uh, yeah, that's why we decided. Well, that's not an interesting story. It's not. So we don't need to include it. Okay. That's the end. Ta-da! <laughs> Do
Does anybody have any questions? Yeah, we, I think we have time for that, right? Yeah, we have 15 minutes. Nice. So I don't know, we can explain what it, how we normally do this kind of thing for those of you who weren't here yesterday. Normally we're not all together like this. Um, we each record our parts separately and then a producer puts them all together in an audio file. And so you can hear, to the person listening, the, the ideal is that you don't know that. But um, it's really fun for us to be able to do this together in one room. Yeah, we don't get to do that uh, pretty much at all because we live every, you know, all around the country. And so New Media Expo is the only time we've really done it. Um, so it's, it's, it's pretty fun for us to be able to actually sit. We've worked with each other for a long time, you know, but you know, here was the first time that we were able to actually sit next to somebody that we've been working with all this time. And we know what each other sound like, but it's so great to be playing off of everybody while we're doing it instead of either waiting for the takes to come in or kind of imagining what Big or Rish or Renee's going to sound like. Except for when you lose your place and don't right. get your line out at the same time as yeah. you're supposed to with <laughs> well, her. And they then I, did, together. <laughs> I was looking this way and talking this way. And so yeah. When we're doing this for podcasts, we can make it perfect. You know, We don't have to... Yeah, they, they said together always works because you just put them together. You don't have to uh, be on the ball like I wasn't. <clears throat> well, perfect is a, a funny word because each producer will do something differently or interpret lines differently or interpret the mood differently. And, for example, he really was the band leader, and the way he reads the story is the feel that you feel for it. But somebody who's a producer could also put whatever kind of music they want to. They can put the sound effects or no sound effects. There can be like the footsteps of somebody walking around or there can be silence. And it's just depending on someone's attitude and how much work they want to put into it. It can make a totally different experience from the same story. And that's something that I have enjoyed since the day we first started working with other people, is to see how other people interpret things. And uh, the choices Renee made in the story are not the choices that someone else would make. So as a writer, it's just like, wow, that was a different story read aloud by them than it was in my head. Was it that way for you? I mean, this was your story. Did you feel that way? Yeah, I, from I, it was reading? takeover day. I had a okay. step back <laughs> and I watched my own story be told through somebody else's uh, mouth. Through and, a video camera. But there are certain things that work in your head and they don't work when they're read aloud. There were a couple of lines that I would have rewritten just listening to the way you guys did them. But those are things that you don't know. You don't know how somebody's going to interpret your line. Or, and, and maybe there's a joke in there that they didn't get or maybe something you didn't realize could be funny. Yeah. It's not so much like acting. I do some acting and you know, you have the same script every night but even just the audience is different. And sometimes they laugh on this yeah, definitely. Yeah, and I think uh, were we to read this a second time, I would surely deliver a lot of the lines differently than I did the first time. Um, and, uh, when you're in the moment, sometimes you're, you you mess up the line when you're reading it, and you're like, oh shoot! But once you're done, you're you're done. You can't go back and reread it. But that's what I would do if we were doing it uh, the normal way, is I would deliver it several times, maybe in different ways, and allow the producer to pick the one they like the best and, uh, and use it that way. There, there are some times when I'm the producer and I'm listening to someone delivering their lines, and they say it one way, and I'm like, oh, oh no, say, say this, say this, and then I am very happy if they do say it the way I want them to. <laughs> and sometimes I'm very sad when they don't. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I've done that, but uh, for the most part, there's there's a lot of things that happen when you record. Just recording, you can basically almost never exactly replicate the environment that you were in the first time. So a lot of times if you do that, it will sound quite different, and it will stick out like a sore thumb if you try and get them to do that. So usually, as long as it's not absolutely awful or they, you know, totally flubbed it or it means now that the way that they said it means exactly the opposite of what it should or something, I will just go with a one of the takes they gave me that's the best. But um, 
Yeah, it just depends. But I think one of the greatest things about doing this kind of thing together is a lot of us are writers, or and I'm a writer, and I do audiobooks. And it's a very sol- both are very solitary types of pursuits. And mm-hmm. so to be able to collaborate with other people is so rewarding because sometimes maybe it's not what you thought it would be, but often it's better. And just hearing how someone else interprets something is really, I know it's helped me just in how I do things in the future, just hearing other people's take on them. Okay, so I missed yesterday and came in late today. <laughs> <laughs> There's one more tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the one tomorrow, Brian, is he's going to try and actually do sound effects. Is that correct? Are you yeah, going Brian to do music as well? The room there. There's some music transitions inside. And see, if I think if we had been super ambitious, we would have recorded a doorbell. We would have recorded a guy banging his head on a uh, mailbox and all that. Scratching. But, but, scratching, but scratching that's it. way more difficult. And, and every time you add a new level, you run the risk of, oh, it... it it was so loud you couldn't hear what people were saying, or uh, you know, or it was so late that it was that it was humorous, <laughs> or, yeah. silly. Yeah, that's the, the one of the things that I worried about in in attempting that. I guess we'll see how it works out in tomorrow's. Uh, what what time is it? Three that it runs? Yeah. So it's a Scott Super story. Scott will be doing a session about his career right before, so he's staying and doing something like that. I think it's uh, this is probably. Is it's in this room here though? But Scott's talk is going to be elsewhere, no, right? Scott's talk is in here. Scott's also. in here too. Oh, could be standing yeah, remotely like probably. Uh huh. Yeah. Hi guys, good job. Um, I had a question. Did you ever consider trying to do this over the net uh, live? Because with Skype now, you can't. If it's set up properly, you can't tell if someone's not in the room. Have you ever experimented with that? Um, we've considered it a lot, to tell you the truth, but I don't think we've ever actually tried it that way. We've done interviews and had you know like post post story talk where we've done it over Skype. Um, but we've never actually tried to do it live. We have, that's been one of those things that we'd wanted to try for a long time, though, is the other thing that we always run into is, you know, people who live in California and people who live in, you know, East Coast and trying to get them <laughs> to figure out a time that's good for everybody to get on and be live at the same time when the time zones are all different. It's always a challenge. It mm-hmm. feels different, though, like she said. Yeah. When you actually hear the way he said the line, and you know your next line is coming up, it informs my line, the way he said his. And her reactions and all that inform your reaction to what she says and all that stuff. So if we could do all episodes over Skype or live or something like that, A, it would be way faster for the editing. Mm -hmm. But two, all the stories, I think, would come out more alive. Mm. Yeah. My other question was, what is the, the time frame? That once you have a story, you record, how long does it take to get everything done and release it? It, it kind of differs, right? I mean, it, Yeah, it, it does depend on who's producing it, how much free time they have kind of a thing. It takes forever. That's what you want. <laughs> <laughs> it takes a long time. I, I, it might be best to like say, what were you saying? How many hours was that? Abby. That was Abby. Was Abby's so, thing? I don't know. Producer oh. of these things too. I, I tell new people expect to spend about um, an hour per finished minute at the beginning. Right. So uh, you may be able to trend that down to forty minutes per finished minute as you get better at it. But but that that for, for a full cast production, that's what you're looking at. If you're reading it by yourself, maybe ten minutes per finished minute. So but for voices like this, and the other reason we don't do it over Skype, part of the reason is. It won't save as much time as you. Rich is right. It's probably better acting, but it is really hard to get people together. And you, Skype recorders are not usually high enough quality um, for audiobooks, which is what I do. They do short stories, but they still need to be pretty good quality. Some people will listen to this more than once. It's not just a chat show. So it needs to be better than interview quality. It needs to be better than your phone quality. So 
the everybody is going to be recording on their individual mic. You're not going to be able to use a Skype recorder. Everyone's going to be recording on their individual mic. They can then send you all tracks. You're still going to have to put all those tracks together. So maybe you get a little bit better acting, but you do have to coordinate time zones. And like their those guys release short story. They kind of aim for one every week, which is they usually can't achieve that. <laughs> two a month. And so like getting everyone together to record over and over and over again becomes really difficult, especially when you're working with lots of different voice actors. And then it, it maybe improves the acting, but I'm not convinced it would save you that much time putting it together because you're still going to have separate tracks for everything because you're going to have high quality mics. You can't be using a, a Skype recorder. Um, at least most people are not going to think that quality is high enough. Yeah, that's what we usually do. We'll have everybody, when we do a Skype thing, we'll have them record it with their own setup. And the Skype will basically just be what we listen to to, you know, converse with and all that. But we don't record the Skype uh, signal itself. And then, yeah, we'll just send the, the hour track so it'll only have our voice on it and then you know you can line them up we actually do a thing like a clapper board you know in film where they clap the thing we'll just have everybody we, you know we count to three and clap our hands and we'll use that to try and line them up so that uh, we can basically have them as close to in sync uh, as you know possible um, but yeah that way we get really high quality in the sound but are still able to use the Skype thing to uh, to converse or whatever over the over the distance and it works out fairly good but it's uh, still a process. <laughs> and then if you want to add sound effects and music, it becomes even more. Yeah, well, putting in sound effects and music and all that stuff uh, tends to be a uh, another process all on its own. Um, we could. You just gotta know those people, I guess. Somebody who's interested in it and is local, you know what I mean? Because, uh. See, where I live, there is a, they call themselves Chatterbox Theater. Uh huh. You know, they do live music and they do live shows and things like that. And that's what they do. Uh huh. Right. Yeah, I've actually thought about getting in touch with a local theater group or something like that just to get myself a bunch of voice actors for the show. I've never tried that, but... When we first started, the two of us lived 40 minutes apart, so I could go to his house and we would record together and we would play off each other. But if there was a child in a story or a woman in a story, it always fell to his kids and his wife. And there's a... There's, there are people that love to perform, and then there are people that hate it. And his wife would be like, can he please get up and leave the room so I can do these lines? And now yeah, she was uncomfortable about yeah, it, she... <laughs> and that translated to the finished product. You could tell she didn't want to be there. And, that, and so when we started to find other people that were talented and female, um, <laughs> it was worth the extra effort of recording theirs and splicing it in and all that stuff just because it feels more real. And then and, and people that want to do it, you, you sense that. And there are that he's got one daughter that loves to perform, and then the other ones don't want to do it. And the performance is always better from the one that's like, "Hey, can it be my turn? Can I do it?" Uh, and so, like you said, I mean, it is acting; it is interpreting lines and trying to make them sound like they're not lines, like it's actually part of a story. Because if there's one bad performance, suddenly you forget that it's re really going on. I mean, sorry that you you, for, you that suspension of disbelief goes away, and you're just like, "Oh yeah." Okay, or if the sound quality is really bad on one person, and that's always been a difficulty with us, where people, somebody's recording in their closet, somebody's recording in a, like a studio, somebody's recording in. Uh, somebody's recording in a room that's like a cave with very hard walls on all sides, and it sounds very echoey and awful. And you try and put those all together. And then, yeah, the, the bad one always sticks out like a sore thumb. Because we're not professionals, we're not doing this for money, sometimes that's the best that you can get is, is the best you can get. And you're not going to call somebody and say, hey, give me that line again, because they're doing it on their own time. And, and nobody likes to be bothered by that kind of thing. But if you were actually going to sell it and everybody understood, like, for example, Abigail will do things that are for sale eventually this so she's much more demanding and she'll say hey listen 
there was a fan or an air conditioner or a baby monitor or something going on in the background, you got to do it all again because it lowers the quality of the whole story if one person has a bzzz going on in the back. And But that's been a, a learning curve for us. We we just started doing it in 2008, and sometimes I listen to those old episodes and I just I wince because, yeah, they're obviously recorded in different environments, and one guy sounds like he's in a car and one guy doesn't. <laughs> but, you know, that's... The, the other thing that you get from using people that are in disparate places is if you can if you can pull people who all have their own shows, which is what I do. I don't do interview. I I don't make casting calls. I use people whose shows I listen to because I listen to a massive number of podcasts, and I know what they sound like. I know what their recording equipment sounds like. I know they can give me the quality audio, and they all have something they want to promote, and so they're kind of invested in it for that reason because and there's tons of talented people out there with with projects and their own podcasts, their own shows, and I find that those people are motivated in a way that my friends and family are not. I mean, they just, they are, because they have something that, and they're constantly getting better in a way that my friends and family are not, because this is not their thing. And I mean, if you happen to have friends and family who are local theater performers, then you're lucky and you have a resource you can tap that isn't available to everybody. But there's tons of people with small shows and projects that are actually quite good at what they do. And, and those people are often more motivated to keep giving you high quality stuff because people people hear their voice on my show or in my book, and and sometimes they go and find you know the other person's project, uh, and you can kind of I, I, that's a form of payment that you can give them that you can't really give to your friends and family because they don't want it or care. All right, I think we're out of time. <laughs> They're opening the door and letting people in for the next one, I guess. So uh, we'll go ahead and. Call it a whatever you call it. A session. A session. We'll call it a session. <laughs> but if you have any other questions, yeah, we'll we'll be hanging around. So if you want to wanna talk to us over on the side or whatever, you can do that. Thank you all. Well, Thanks. You have a good day. Our cast list for today goes as follows. Did you fart? I farted so bad it hurt. <laughs> oh, yikes! <laughs> it burns. Oh man. <laughs>